It's kind of ridiculous for me to ask this, but I imagine you're like chugging water. I think you probably, I mean, you're strapped in that car for how long in a race? Oh, hour and a half, two and a half. What about, don't you have to pee? Well, yes. In this episode, I traveled to New York City to interview NASCAR driver Julia Landauer. Julia Landauer knew she wanted to be a NASCAR driver at the age of 12. Since then, she's become a NASCAR Next and NASCAR k &N Pro Series driver. At 24 years old, she's made a name for herself in a male-dominated sport, and she does it all herself. She handles her own publicity, her own social media. She even goes and presents to land her own sponsors and landed herself on the One Love Foundation GCR racing team. She has also become a sought-after speaker, an advocate for women in STEM, and was listed recently in Forbes 30 Under 30 list in the sports category. If you are building a personal brand, trying to get sponsorships, trying to excel as the underdog in your industry, you will love this interview with Julia Landauer. Thank you for joining me for another episode of The Pursuit. I'm Kelsey Humphreys. Today I am here with Julia Landauer in New York City where she's from, although you're not ever here because you guys, <laughs> she is a race car driver. How cool is that? And I'm so excited to talk to you today. So thanks for fitting us in. Of course, thank you for having me. We're Always fun to come back to New York. headed into the holidays, even though this comes out after that. So I appreciate you taking some thank time you. out to do this with us. But I think people will be fascinated with your story because She's a NASCAR driver, but you're just starting out and you've had to build your brand and get your sponsors and do your whole career pretty much mm -hmm. yourself. So you're almost basically like a solopreneur, yeah. which I love. But let's go back to the beginning because I want to know how a New Yorker, which New Yorkers don't really drive, <laughs> you know, ended up as a race car driver. Well, it's funny because I think in New York you need to be 18 to get your driver's license if you don't take driver's ed. And I had my racing car license when I was 13. Um, but I started in go-karts when I was 10. My parents wanted an activity that their daughters could do against boys. They really wanted us to experience working and competing against huh. the other sex. So that was really cool and I fell in love with it. I'm not sure my parents expected that. Yeah. But I really <laughs> knew by the time I was 12 that I wanted to do this professionally. So we figured out together how to climb the racing ranks and um, in 2015 I raced full-time in the NASCAR series won a championship there and have that really catapulted my career to keep climbing the ranks of NASCAR congratulations Thank that's you. awesome but so you're 12 years old did your parents take some convincing or could they see like oh she has so much potential yeah I mean I think I was very lucky growing up that my parents were very um, you know, concerned about making sure that we were passionate about what we were doing and they mm -hmm. gave us that freedom to do whatever we want. And they're a doctor and a lawyer, so very traditional <laughs> like education, traditional. license wow. to do what yeah. they do and but there was no pressure to do that. They wanted us to find something that we would dive in head first, you know, work really hard at and they could see it in my eyes, I think. They could see that how much I loved it. They racing is so great for kids because you have to work with adults so you're held to a higher level mm. of responsibility, you know, you're manhandling a machine that's dangerous around other people. Mm -hmm. And so you're just really taught a lot of responsibility. So I think even if we hadn't, even if I hadn't decided to go professional, that it would have been beneficial to mm. me no matter what. It was beneficial to my sister and then my brother who aren't racing full time now. Wow. So what did your life look like at 12? You decide, <laughs> you know, let's commit and yeah. go to the next level. Were you having, I mean, you had, you're still in school. Yeah. So, so I, it was important to me and it was important to my parents to finish school. And then I later went on to Stanford um, because they wanted me to be a good, like a social person who could interact with other people <laughs> and uh, just cars. <laughs> learn. Yeah. And, and also to be able, it really taught me, I realized in hindsight, to be able to convey the message of racing and how cool it is to be able to articulate that to people who weren't familiar with it. Hmm. So it was good practice, but um, yeah, I was you know going to school during the week. Race weekends typically start on Thursday. That's when the setup day is. So I definitely missed a lot of school. I missed hmm. somewhere near like 130 days of high school uh, to go wow. racing. Um, it was really tough my sophomore year when I was racing on Wednesday nights in Indiana. So my mom and I would fly out, and I was still under 18. So I. And I was 15 or 16, so I had to fly with a companion. So right. It was tough. There was a lot of dedication on my parents' part. Yeah. Um, but it was great. I, I loved it. 
So what about friendships? I mean, would you say you had like, a, I mean, that's an atypical childhood. So yeah. how did, and did everyone think you were a little bit crazy? Uh, <laughs> I think people didn't understand it necessarily. Yeah. Um, they didn't quite get the racing and a lot of New Yorkers don't want to grow up watching it. You don't go to short tracks and watch races on a Saturday night. Um, but I, I mean, I'm still really close with my high school friends and, um, you know, I have three really great friends from high school, three really great friends from college that, you know, we, we keep in touch, you know, when you, when you find those people that you just mesh with, you know, distance and time doesn't really affect it. So I was very lucky. And, and when I was at school, I really, you know, dedicated myself to being in school. I, I tried to be very present where I am and mm. I knew I wasn't gonna be able to hang out with them on the weekends and I missed birthday parties and all that stuff. So when I was there, really try to make sure I was giving my friends the attention. Right, which is a great lesson. Mm -hmm. But then you go to college and you major in technology entrepreneurship, is that right? That's part of it, yeah. It's called science, technology, and society. So very oh, okay. interdisciplinary. And my, I'm like, I sculpted my major around some computer science, some mechanical engineering design work, and then communications and history and English to really try to you know, get a well-rounded education to be able to help primarily with mm. my racing career and brand. And that goes back to being a solopreneur, is that what you call it? Yes, yeah. yeah. So like, you know, I need to know how to write press releases. I needed wow. to know how to connect with an audience, you know, to really convey my brand and my messaging, which I didn't do well all the time. And it takes trial and error. So it was really cool. And then from the technical standpoint, to be able to understand all about how the cars work and kind of more of the technical stuff within the industry has been really beneficial. But I mean, you're 17. Did you have a mentor that was like, you need to learn about how to communicate and write press releases? Um, no, I mean, I think I really kind smart. of... smart. Thank you. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I knew what I was lacking. I knew, mm -hmm. I knew after, I guess at 17 and 18, I had been in racing for eight years at that point. So I kind of knew what was expected of me. And I knew that I needed to learn how to, you know, be good in front of a camera and how to, I knew I was going to have to get sponsorship. So I knew I was going to have to learn how to make a presentation, make mm. a good sell and, you know, be good in a boardroom. So just when you're hungry for something, you figure out what you need to do to yeah, make it work. Right. Okay, before we go to the boardroom, which is great, I really yeah. want to dive into that. I wanted to know, did you have like a big break? I mean, was there something, was there one particular race or sort of tipping point? Coming up, don't miss her number one piece of advice for achieving success. But first, I want to remind you that if you love these celebrity interviews, there are three ways you can support this show, this free show here on the internet, you guys. First, you can like this video and share it with your hustler and dreamer friends. Second, you can subscribe to the channel. And lastly, you can sign up to join Pursuit Nation. When you do, I will give you my top 10 success hacks for real life. How do we take all the tactics in these interviews with millionaires and celebrities and actually apply them to pursuing our own dream? That's what I break down in this PDF. Get your free copy at thepursuit.tv slash top 10. I also want to take a second to tell you about something really cool for those of you who are freelancers, if you have a service-based business, or maybe multiple side hustles, and you have a lot of invoices going out and hopefully a lot of that cash money coming in, right? If you're having trouble staying organized with all of that, you've got to check out FreshBooks. You can go right now and it takes 30 seconds to set up and you have a professional invoice with your colors and logo. No more recreating clunky Word documents over and over again, you guys. You can use the time tracker tool when you work to immediately bill your hours to a specific client. And later you don't have to have that awkward conversation when your client forgets to pay because FreshBooks will automatically send follow-up emails for you. Plus, in the dashboard you can see quickly what's coming in, what's going out, and what's past due. You can easily sync your business credit card to automatically record and categorize your expenses. And best of all, it saves you hours of frustration and agony during the worst time of the year, tax season, because it tracks all of your tax information for you as you use it. All you freelancers, consultants, and coaches are going to seriously love it. And FreshBooks is offering a free 30-day trial to Pursuit Nation. So go to freshbooks.com slash pursuit to start today. Make sure when the pop-up asks how you heard about them, you put in the pursuit. If you're crushing it with your clients, but not so much with the organization, again, that's freshbooks.com slash pursuit. I wanted to know, did you have like a big break? I mean, was there something, was there one particular race or sort of tipping point? Um, well, when I was 14 in my first full season of cars, I won the championship that I was racing for. So that was really wow. good at proving, okay, this little tiny 14 year old girl is going <laughs> to be able to, to do it. 
Um, and then I kind of raced partial seasons through college and everything just because I had to balance both and both were important. Um, but then in 2015, when I became the first woman to win a track championship in my division of NASCAR at that track, um, it caught a lot of attention and it allowed me to move up to basically the last amateur series in NASCAR this past year, which was televised on NBCSN. And well, that was a really cool point and made, made my presence known within the NASCAR world and within NASCAR corporate. So I think that mm. season as a whole, I was working way harder off the track and on the track and also working on the publicity and really just catching attention, making people know, hey, I'm here and I'm a yeah. force and I'm going to make it work somehow. I don't know how yet, but it's going to work. Wow. So before that race, did you have a sponsor? Um, uh, racing is primarily family funded for a long time. I mean, I've had like little sponsors here and there. Um, and this year my sponsors were Toyota and Napa filters and um, which was really cool to get in with the Toyota How'd you family. do that? Um, it was through relationships, through relationships with the team that I knew. Um, you know, they, they wanted to, you know, help an up-and-coming female, and so I was there. So did you go present, or did they reach out no, to you? No, this or? one was more reaching out to me, but I mean, still had to prove that I was worth the investment. Mm -hmm. But it was a less typical boardroom presentation. It was more kind of the behind the scenes, having the conversations, showing, explaining what I was going to do for them, and at the end of the day, I just had to prove myself on track. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, what, what are you, I mean, you you either have results or you don't, right? What else yeah. can you sell them on? Well, at the end of the day, any sponsor is getting involved with NASCAR to either sell more products or get mm -hmm. more users or whatever it might be. So usually performance is the driver of, no pun intended, <laughs> <laughs> is nice. the driver of, you know, your exposure and how much recognition you get. And that's where being a female is definitely an interesting factor to throw into the equation because, um, you know, Danica is a really good example. She hasn't won a race yet, um, but she's one of the highest earning NASCAR mm -hmm. drivers and she brings in a ton of money to the sport. So it really depends whatever value the company is looking for, that's what you have to provide. So for me, it could be, you know, we've had people who are interested in employee engagement that I can do and really like inspiring the employees to work as hard as they can and just mm. you know, that kind of that is really valuable to people or to be able to you know have direct to consumer access at the tracks for their products so it really just it takes a lot of research to figure out okay and conversations you know what what do you need what problems are you trying to solve and is there a way that me and my platform and nascar can be beneficial to that mm -hmm. let's talk about platform what have you done to grow that like grow followers and yeah. get visibility Ooh, social media is hard <laughs> um, <laughs> um but part of it i've done a couple things so one um i was on survivor when i was 2021 20, the tv show and That's so right, yeah that. part of that was you know a really cool challenge just like independent of anything else really cool to go on really difficult it is authentic i mean it's very real um but you know it was exposure in front of nine million people it wasn't the exposure i had hoped for i got mm. the boring edit um oh. and uh it was it was tough and there was a lot of criticism for how bland i was which was a good branding lesson for me you know i to chose not to, to tell people i went to stanford but i was a sophomore in college so with my whole world i was kind of concealing and i just realized i didn't have as much to talk about so that was a huge lesson in authenticity oh owning who you are, not needing to appeal to everybody. Hmm. Um, and from there, I really just worked on being able to convey my personality, you know, try to do interviews wherever I can, um, you know, work with various groups, do the public speaking, just get in front of big audiences and, you know, tell my story in a way that's beneficial to other people. That's what I'm learning. If I can benefit other people, that's going to help propel me forward. Yeah. Let's talk about speaking. How, what about like the first time you're like, okay, you know what, I should probably do some speaking gigs. How did that start? Well, it started actually in the beginning of college when I was just really interested in connecting with various um, nonprofits that were working towards helping empower younger girls. That was what I wanted to do. Um, and so I just volunteered my time to go in and talk with girls, give presentations, answer questions, whether it was school related or confidence related. Um, and then my senior year of college, the TEDx Stanford group asked me if I would give a TEDx talk at their event. I was like, yes, you bet. <laughs> yeah. I got to work with a coach, which was really great. And that I found out I could make people laugh. And I was sparking conversation. And people didn't agree with me. And that was sparking conversation. And so from there, I just started you know, very slowly trying to build that career and started pitching myself and learning you know, what I'm worth as a fee and just like learning mm. all the negotiation skills I hadn't had to deal with up to that point. Um, and then it's, so that was in 2014, and now we're you know 2016, and it's really grown quite a bit, and now it's a much more regular thing, and it's cool to still be able to tell the stories that people get excited by and they're inspired by, and it, you know, it's entertaining too. So, and yeah. I have fun on stage. Like it's really fun to have that interaction with the crowd and know, okay, this worked, this didn't work, reassess, fix it. Um, 
And it's a good energy. Yeah, and it kind of makes sense that you would like to be under pressure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> those little butterflies, I, yeah. I thrive on those. Yeah. yeah, I do as well, which is why, you know, yeah. when the camera's on, you have to go. Oh, yeah. Um, and so uh, right now, kind of what does your business look like? I mean, are you making most of your money from, do you, you get money when you win races, right? Yeah, and there's then, prize money for sure. And then you have speaking gigs. So kind of, do you know like what the percentages are or? Yeah, I mean, it just depends. You know, racing, you really don't start making a lot of money in racing until you're in the top two or three professional series, which would be the next step up for me. But even then, a lot of people aren't making money early mm. on. It's it's not the best sport to get into. <laughs> Once you get to the top, you make a lot, but um, yeah. to get there is really tough. But yeah, you get a percentage of your winnings. Some of it goes back to the team. It kind of depends how the sponsorship structure works out. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're bringing a lot of money to the table, your percentage might be higher than if the team is providing mm -hmm. you the ride. And um, you negotiate that stuff with them or yeah, try, yeah, try to? Yeah, yeah, you, um, and that just is a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, speaking is really my big form of income and then some other stuff on the side. but. I mean, it's hustling. It's, yeah. I'm not, you know, not living the life yet for yeah. sure. So what about mentors? I mean, you're in a male mm -hmm. field, you mm -hmm. know, you're in a male dominated industry. Have you talked to Danica? Have you like reached out to her? Is she? I've spoken with her a little bit at various NASCAR events, but not as much. One of my biggest mentors on track is actually Lynn St. James, who is a retired racer. And she was the first woman to win the rookie of the race award for the Indy 500. Mm. And, um, you know, she has helped so many young women in racing. She had a Women in the Winter Circle Foundation where she taught you about nutrition and, hmm. you know, physical strength and media stuff. And so she's really been a great source for me to be able to bounce, you know, bounce ideas off of. And to, you know, I had a lot of, there was a lot of stuff that went on this year that was just a new experience for me that on track and, and with the team that I just wanted to see, okay, is this normal? Like, did you go through some of this? And so just hmm. really reassuring. Um, but then also mentors from Stanford. I got a great mentor when I was a senior who has helped me from the business side, from the ideation side, in terms of how we can expand the brand, different partnerships that I could try to go after. So I've been quite lucky, and my parents are you know, huge rocks for me. So I've been really lucky with the mentors that I've had, and they've been so crucial. And so I understand that, you know, as I that I already can be, you know, a type of mentor to other people as well and younger women who are trying to, you know, make their careers work. And it's just, it's exciting. Yeah. It's a give and take relationship and it's, it's really cool. You mentioned health. What kind of health habits do you have to have as a race car? Yeah, driver? so people think you, know, you don't have to be in shape for racing, but imagine like you're muscling around a 3,400 pound car. You're doing that for hours on end. You're strapped in so tight, so all you have is your arm movement, and you're fighting the G-forces when you're going around a corner, mm -hmm. and the motor's right there, which means the cockpit gets really hot, and I think it reached a high of like 145 degrees this year in my car, not even the top-level car. Um, wow. Yeah, and you're fully suited, so it's a lot of strength and endurance, not brute strength, right? Men and women can do it together, but I mean, mm -hmm. you've got to be in incredibly good shape and deal with the heat. Heat exhaustion is the big thing. So, um, you know, I train six days a week. It alternates between endurance and strength. Um, I actually, I live in North Carolina, so it gets really hot. And um, I started training outside in the summer. So I just got used to the humidity and the heat. Um, and then I eat, I try to eat healthy. I still love, you know, cheese, pasta. I mean, I eat, <laughs> I eat a normal diet, but just all in moderation. I try to keep it really clean, um, you know, get mm -hmm. a good balance of vitamins and nutrients and limit the processed and this is kind of ridiculous for me to ask this, but I imagine you're like chugging water and you probably, I mean, you're strapped in that car for how long in a race? Oh, hour and a half, two and a half. What about, don't you have to pee? Well, yes. <laughs> uh, short answer is that sometimes. Now, part of it is that like I, I've learned that, you know, I need to really stop chugging water about 45 minutes before a race and then mm. just go to the bathroom right beforehand. And usually then I can just sip on the water that I have in the car on our caution flags, like when the racing stops mm. and there's a crash or something. Um, but you sweat out so much that a lot of times oh, that's that, true. but not all the time. And there are times <laughs> where, you know, I feel so bad for the team because then they have to you know, work in the car. But if you got to go, you got to go. And it's wow. super hard to relax your muscles. I will say the first, like trying to <laughs> relax your muscles enough to like let yourself relieve wow. yourself really hard, but it's, you can't be uncomfortable. Wow, that is crazy. So do you have any advice out there for just not in the racing industry, mm -hmm. but just women who are trying to make their way in a male industry? Yes, I have quite a bit, and so I'll narrow it down to kind of the most important, I think. And one is that you have to assume that no one's going to be supporting you and no one's really? going to be in your favor. Assume that your agenda does not align 
with other people's agenda. And so you have to be your biggest cheerleader. You have to be your harshest critic. You know, hopefully you have a group around you, whether it's family or friends or you know partners who will help you. But I have found that I would assume that people would have wanted to help me and they didn't. And so really just having that personal strength to say, okay, you might not see my vision, but that just means that I need to prove it to you. You know, like don't mm. let other people's lack of creativity and lack of vision get in your way. Wow. I think it's applicable to most people, yeah. not just women. Um, there is, you know, the subtle biases against women, whether it's, you know, in word choice, language, you know, body language towards um, women. I have found that even as I've proven myself, I still deal with it and it's awful. And so trying to, I guess, find male allies almost. So for me mm. this year, my driver coach was able to see that the boys raced me a lot harder. They were much dirtier. They moved me out of the way and like bumped into me more than they did other guys. Cause like, God forbid they get beat by a girl. Yeah. Um, so, but once he was able to see that, he realized, okay, she's dealing with so much more. And so then he was able to kind of advocate, okay, the reason her car has more bumps and bangs on it is because they're making mm. it that much harder. So finding allies who will help be the advocate for you, um, having that bulldog, I guess, is yeah. really important. And um, I don't know, just believing in yourself. And I know that sounds kind of silly and <laughs> cliche or anything, but I mean, if you don't have confidence, why would anyone else want to help you if they're interested? So. You know, if you have to journal right, if you need to, you know, look in the mirror and like pump yourself up. What do you do? do that. I'm a pretty confident person uh, <laughs> to start with, um, but I mean, I, you know, I write out and I, you know, I, I present the facts to myself to prove mm. that. Okay, you know, even because I have doubts all the time and I wonder, am I good enough racer? Am I all this? And then I present the facts. Hey, I was running up front this year in my first year in this series. You know, I'm just as good. You know, just mm -hmm. doing my list of accomplishments yeah. and be like, okay. I've done this, it's fine. Yeah, so great. Um, okay, so I wanna, I'll edit this back in, but you mentioned, um, cause I wanna talk about the first time you had to get outside sponsorship outside of your family. Mm -hmm. So how did you, let me just, so the first time you had to go ask for money outside of just your parents supporting yeah. you, how did that happen? How did you do that? How did you, did you have a guide? Did anybody help you? Yes. Yes to all of that. <laughs> um, um, so I've, I've been actively pitching sponsorship for several years now and I've learned quite a bit. Like I look back on two years ago and I was like, ooh, that was not a good presentation, <laughs> not a good argument. Um, but really I've done some cold calling, some, um, you know, NAS I mean, not NASCAR, uh, Stanford has a really great network. And so being, the alumni is a very tight knit community. And so to be able to just reach out to various alumni and mm. pick their brains and a lot of times they will say, hey, I think you'd be a good fit with this company. Um, and that was really how I went about it, but I did my own pitch decks and I ran them by, you know, I met um, someone who worked at a, an investment company who was willing to just look at the deck to see if they would be interested in, if their marketing team would be interested in sponsorship and he helped critique it and just, like that kind of help was really great and it, like, you know, that's a blessing and a gift. Um, but then just practicing stuff and when people say no, I had no shame in asking, okay, what, what was not attractive to you? What, mm -hmm. what didn't work? Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's just that, NASCAR is a tough investment. It's a tough sport to, to, to break into mm -hmm. as a new sponsor, and it's very expensive. Um, but, you know, it was a lot of trial and error, and there are things I look back and I was like, oh, what a wasted opportunity. I just totally blew that. <laughs> and then you just try not to do it again, right? You, But, um, yeah, mentors, a lot of cold calling, which doesn't work all the time, but it has. I mean, I had a sponsor in 2015 who, he happened to have gone to my high school here in New York, Stuyvesant High School, mm. but I mean, I made a case and he gave me a little chunk of money to sponsor a race. So that was really mm. cool and it's just, I'm learning that there's no set way to do it. You know, everything, mm. you know, you can go to a big corporation and you'd have to, you know, be, be really diligent on ROI and returns like quarterly and everything. Or you have a relationship with someone who just is emotionally invested and wants to help out, and then it's a little bit of a different process. So you got to be on your toes. It's it's really aggressive in yeah. that sense. Wow. Well, thank you so much. I feel like this is really fascinating, and you had so many good points that I'm already like I'm already writing oh, the article. So thank you. And I think it's just like a fresh new. You know, people just see what's happening on TV when they watch NASCAR, and they don't right. think about. I mean, when we look at like Danica Patrick, we're like, oh, well, that person's made it. Well, she yeah. had to do what you're doing now exactly. to get where she is today. So I can't wait until a few years from. I'm like, I interviewed. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because NASCAR, I mean, has changed so much 
even though in the 10 years, like, you know, in 10 years, or even the five years since Danica has gotten in here, it's just, it's a changing landscape and the whole digital component and how people consume media is changing. So as a driver who's from New York City, you know, female, not from a racing family, like, you know, I gotta be super creative and luckily mm. NASCAR has been open to that and that helps them get new fans. So it's been a really exciting journey. And are you doing anything unique or different online, like digitally, how are you? Um, I'm, I'm trying, and part of this is being, you know, I have a manager now, and I have a developer um, and a lawyer and a small core team, um, but it's still majority me, and so you just, I realize I'm getting strung for time, but I'm starting to do more Facebook Live stuff. I think that that's a really cool way to connect with fans and get more get more people interested. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still working on it, though. I'm, yeah. I'm still trying. I, I'm excited for the day when I will have a social media consultant to, to help out a <laughs> or little bit assistant. more. assistant, I understand. Okay, I yes, understand. assistant. That's when you know you've yes. made it. I was at a talk uh, the other day, and I was just like, wow, imagine if I had an assistant who could take all these photos for me or take the behind-the-scenes photos that I want. Yeah. So we'll get there one day. Yes, which is why I don't Snapchat. I don't do oh, behind-the-scenes. Right. Like, eventually we'll be doing that. But That's hopefully right. everyone who watches this, go follow her on social media because this girl knows how to hustle. And Here are my top few keys to success for the rest of us from my interview with Jessica Landauer. Specifically for those of you who are on the younger side of things, hustling while you're still in high school or college. Number one, be present. If you're pursuing a dream and building a business while still in school, that takes a lot of energy and focus. Landauer had to miss a ton of school, games, pep rallies, birthday parties, time with friends. She says the only way to juggle it all well is to be fully present where you are when you're there. Number two, tailor your education. Though one could argue that she didn't need a college degree, she wanted one and she decided to make one that would work for her. She blended computer science, engineering, communications, and English. So even though some people will say, just double down on your strengths and just focus on your talent, I have found you guys that it's much more realistic that you won't be able to outsource your strengths for the first few years. So get an education around the few most important brand building things that you need to learn. Number three, tell your authentic story. We need to learn from her mistake on Survivor, you guys. She didn't want to tell her story, so she had nothing to talk about, and she became forgettable, which is what we don't want. So she advises people now to work on conveying their personality and telling their story in a unique way that will benefit and resonate with people. Number four, find mentors. Of course, she has mentors from college and in the racing community, but I specifically love a really smart move she made when she met someone who worked in investment and just ask them to look over her pitch deck for the critique alone. It takes guts to just ask for that kind of honest feedback. So go and find mentors, but more importantly, ask those mentors for help and guidance. Number five, capitalize on what makes you different. Obviously, performance is key when it comes to getting sponsorships and exposure, but she realized early on that she could use the fact that she's a woman in a male-dominated industry to get specific sponsors that were looking for that. She had to ask herself, what do they need? What kind of problems can she solve for them? How can she be beneficial to them? So it did take research, and it also leads to the next point, which is to Realize it's not about you. A lot of times, young entrepreneurs and even seasoned entrepreneurs, people who are pursuing a dream but maybe we're working on a new project, we're overflowing with passion. And sometimes we think that passion is gonna mean everyone else is excited and ready to get out their checkbooks. But instead, we have to remember that results are what matter. Value is what matters. Remember that the market is the market and frankly, it doesn't care about how passionate you are. Landar said she thought that everyone was rooting for her and that people would automatically line up with her agenda. And she said that just simply wasn't the case and she had to stop assuming that. But don't let other people's lack of creativity or lack of vision get in your way, which leads to the last point, believe in yourself. She knows it's cheesy, but she says you have to find your confidence somehow. And personally, I love her method of how to build your confidence back up which is to simply list the facts in black and white. Try and take the emotion out of it and instead just list all your accomplishments and you'll realize, hey, I'm pretty awesome. Now I'd love to know what was your favorite lesson from this interview? Leave a comment and if you wanna learn the juicy behind the scenes details like what was she like in person, how did I land this interview, bloopers and more, go to thepursuit.tv slash Julia Landau. Everyone who reads the article, I hope I'll just direct them all to your oh, Facebook thank you. and we'll just thank explode you. your Facebook account. I so, love it. Thank you again. I'm Kelsey Humphreys here with Julia Landauer and this has been The Pursuit.